Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Good morning and happy Tuesday, everybody. This is the Tuesday, October 27th special meeting of the Board of Education. Uh, thank you for joining us. Bill, if you would take roll, please. Yep. President Collin. Here. Vice President Sayer. Here. Secretary Rouse is here. Treasurer Fidel. I saw her. Yep. Listed as Melissa K on here. I'm here. Too many accounts. <laughs> uh, Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Yeah. Member Lauterbach. Here. Oh, yeah. All right, we have all seven, Scott. Okay. Thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. All right, uh, we're going to jump right into our request to address the board. Um, it's my understanding we have somebody waiting in the queue, although I don't know who that is yet. Um, Mike, can you help me out? Yeah. Oh, we have we have Paul Phil, uh, who wants to address the board uh, regarding COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Phil, you have, and he, I believe, five minutes, and the floor is yours. Yes, and here's in the board meeting, so he's getting ready. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Is my mic on? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, the time, your time today. I just want to introduce myself quickly. Uh, I'm an educator and an MPS parent and um, graduate of Midland High 86. Uh, and uh, even though I have uh, children at Dow High, I was kind of pleased with the uh, football outcome last weekend, <laughs> I'll just have to say. So it was hard to suppress that, but, uh, you know, I faked the tears. Um, <clears throat> so I, I also teach at First State University College of Pharmacy, and I have a clinical practice in the inpatient setting at Covenant Hospital in Saginaw. So in that building, we've seen 1,700 positive co uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 patients, and I've seen them up close and personal, rounding on the family medicine team and on the pediatric floor. I spend every day on the pediatric floor uh, at Covenant, which is the... Um, the pediatric unit uh, for the whole region. We admit the patients all the way from Clare to Alpena to Tuscola out in the thumb. So a catchment area of about a million uh, population. So we will see all of the sick pediatric coronavirus patients. And one of my take home points today is that, uh, you know, not a political point. It is a front hand uh, data driven point Pedi um, pediatric patients are not intensely affected by coronavirus. We have a mortality rate that we're looking at right now in the country that is half the mortality rate of influenza over the last three years. So half of the influenza mortality rate, and we haven't closed down the uh, schools for influenza in one of those years. We need to keep that into consideration as our risk for disease and, and death in our students. That is at the very top of your minds, I'm sure, is the safety of the students. And we have to put that in perspective. We, um, we also have to look at the side effects of, of a shutdown, which uh, I understand is being considered a, a going to remote, excuse me, going to remote. We have seen a, a major spike in suicidality and suicide attempts on the pediatric unit at Covenant. It's, it's local. It's, it's a cultural thing, so we have to look at it on a local level. We have I've come to the pediatric unit on multiple occasions since in the last 32 weeks of the pandemic and had two suicide attempts on a 20-bed unit, and we faced that. Uh, it has been very dramatic, so we, we have to keep that in mind as well. So there's been a lot of uh, depression and, and suicidality in the pediatric population. Um, we, uh, we have to ask the question before we get um, to another uh, session of remote, will we reduce um, the risk of morbidity and mortality in our population, not just in, in the kids, in the staff as well? Uh, obviously, you're very concerned about your staff members, your teachers, your uh, and ancillary staff. Let me tell you from our perspective at Covenant, we have 4,500 employees in the building and um, who, who come in and out and <laughs> circulate with 1,700 positive patients. I mean, it is a hot zone. It is high risk. We have had hundreds of employees test positive in the first few months when we were learning things. Before we implemented the things that you've implemented, we had problems with PPE and everything. 
We're doing much better with that. We have had no employees that have uh, succumbed to date. We've had sick folks, of course, but I asked around. It's, this isn't like a public, you know, data point that I can provide to you. We don't tell you about specific patient information, of course. But um, I asked administrators, and I said, have we had anybody die? And, and they, I have not been able to find that occur. We've had some sick employees, but uh, we've done quite well with that. But we've had hundreds of positives, and I want to reassure you that we're doing much better with that um, now. So um, how do we do that? We do the same things that you're doing, and not even some of the things that you're doing in the classroom. So with hand washing, with masking, with social distancing, you're putting up the plastic screens, you're doing everything that you can do. Um, and we can even think of some more things, and I'll have a couple of things to add at the end of my comments in just a moment as to what you might consider. But the question now is, is it safer for staff to teach remote, or is it safer for them to come to school? And um, I'll submit to you that we, uh, you have to ask that question of, of Dr. Yanoski, of the, of the other, your other <laughs> experts, before you can make the decision. I'm pretty confident nobody has the answer to that. We should be seeing the answer to that. And if you want to look at it, look at Washtenaw County. You do not use there. Ann Arbor Public Schools are closed down. They are, they are not face to face. And they are seeing the same bump. Okay, we are at 2 to 3% positive rate since June. Now we're at 4 to 5% positive rate. That's what Washtenaw is seeing as well. The data is not there to support another lockdown. I'd submit to you that you need to ask those questions before we get to another zoomification of our learning outcomes, which we all know is not good. I know that from an educator standpoint, tomorrow I'm giving a mixed Zoom in-person uh, uh, lecture to uh, 62 students for two hours and then for two hours again. I know the differential learning outcomes between Zoom and face-to-face, -face, and you know them too. I know you guys know the, the assignment turn-in rates and academic performance rates, so please consider that. I don't think it's an, it's an experiment that we can perform again uh, legitimately on kids unless we know that they're safer at home in an uncontrolled environment and our staff are safer at home or, or teaching from school with Zoom in that environment. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Mr. Phil, thank you for joining us this morning. And, uh, you know, thank you for everything that you do for us as a frontline worker. Um, I appreciate you coming in to advocate for the safety of our students and keeping schools open. Um, <laughs> as you know, and I'm sure everybody knows, the safety of our students and staff is paramount to this board, to this administration. So we, uh, we thank you for your time today. Uh, I think Mr. Thill was the only person uh, wanting to address the board this morning. Mike, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's what we have. Okay. Seeing nobody else, we're going to move on. Uh, next up is item 3.1. We have an action item. This is a resolution regarding the Open Meetings Act. Yes, so <clears throat> uh, October 19th, if you, if you look at the document, we received this from Neola. And so this is a uh, recommended policy to allow us to continue the Zoom meetings if needed going forward. Now, as of uh, January 1, there's some changes to that. Um, but Pam might be a good case right now um, where she couldn't meet face to face and this would allow her to be able to zoom in if we were face to face in a board meeting. So we are looking for you to take action on that resolution. Okay. I move to approve item 3.1, the resolution to allow us to have open meetings via Zoom. Support. Motion by uh, Pam, support by Phil. Uh, any discussion beyond what Mike had mentioned? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next up, item 3.2. This is discussion regarding the current COVID cases affecting <clears throat> Midland Public Schools. Mike. Yeah, so you, you got a message from me over the weekend. You know, we were um, trending backward, upward, um, you know, for a while with the Jefferson case uh, where we got into the 90s and last week we had a nice period we were down into about 20 student staff isolated um, but we will probably reach again 90 again today and those numbers began to increase over the weekend and we, I had some concern when you look begin to look at the state and the county numbers and so 
um, want it to be proactive where we can get ahead of this just a little bit and look at what, what, what might occur if a shutdown is needed. And we all know that um, <clears throat> the holidays are coming as well, and how does that play into all those pieces of it? And so it, without being caught on a moment to notice like we were in March and giving parents a day or two to adjust, you know, was there a logical sequence of events to go? And, and um, you know, I don't, I'm not clear, you know, if that authority is actually mine or ours completely. It appears um, from discussions yesterday that we can time um, any resolution coming from the state level. Um, and so it is probably likely a county health level <coughs> and a school board level decision um, on these events. So we held a discussion yesterday with our county health department and Fred, Fred Yanoski, the director, and Fred walked us through some pretty good key points yesterday that makes us feel a little better, I think, going through this. Um, right now we're experiencing about a 4.5% positivity rate. Um, that's a seven-day uh, running rate, um, a day or two behind. But we were 4.5%, that's what he quoted yesterday, is where we were standing. Um, he also pointed out that they are now doing the double of the amount of tests that they once were given. So significantly testing more individuals, and therefore you'd likely you know, be able to uh, diagnose more positive tests as well. Um, of course, he has turned increasing rate. Um, in like some of our cases, like over the weekend, most of those were among adults. Probably to our, our speaker's point today, um, the, the positivity rate among our students is actually still relatively low. And so we've had um, only a few students get tested, but we now begin to see staff members test positive. In fact, you probably will increase some kids' quarantine um, at close contacts because it's a little bit more difficult to say that the teacher's only in one location in the six feet per 15 minutes comes into factor. Um, Fred pointed out early that we, the school system has yet to have any outbreaks, and so our closest to an outbreak would have been Jefferson, where um, one of the positive cases led to a second positive case. But we've really had not had any spread within our buildings um, going on at all. Um, so I think that the discussion today is probably a little more different than I thought we were going to have over the weekend, but the discussion may be more about if there is one in the future, what that may mean and, and what may we do. Um, and so Fred told us that shutting down school for a week it really does not clear it. If we did shut down, he's, he said that it, the recommendation is 28 days shut down. So I think we need to keep that in our mind as we go. If there was a shutdown, it would be a full month uh, being closed to, to do that. We are, you know, we do, we do have staff ready for the most part mm -hmm. to transition quickly to for virtual if we need to. Um, but, uh, you know, I think at this point, the recommendation from the health department is it is not needed. Now, he would back us if we wanted to make that decision, but he does not believe it's needed. We haven't have been, been a spread. And maybe also our speaker kind of spoke, pulled Fred's words. He believes that we are safer with our children in school um, than out because of behaviors and so you know mm -hmm. when our kids are in school they're in a pretty structured environment pretty safe environment for six to eight hours a day and um, so far that's been pretty good athletics music and band have become a, a topic for us as well um, you know as the weather weather has gotten colder our return to school plan has stated that those activities could should occur outside um, they're ready to move inside, and they can move inside with probably with, with limitations, though. Um, right now, I don't think our recommendation is to allow for um, the horns to be played in the building, um, d despite that some protocols say you could accommodate that. I think with increasing cases and numbers, that would be a bad piece of it. It's the same with our PE classes. They'll be inside, but they will ha they'll have to do it with a lot of limitations um, in their distance and what activities they're actually participating. As you know, Michigan High School Athletics took a, um, a po polling um, vote amongst their committees last week, and they've kind of decided to go forward with winter athletics. But I think we're going to have to revisit that as a board, and I think you will see school districts begin to do that. Um, they may, they will start practicing as early as next week. And so practices similar to when we were in August amongst our own um, pod of students may be one thing, but when you begin to look at athletic contest and indoor environment and close contacts um, occurring here early in December, we may have to tackle that one if cases continue to increase. So really, uh, I guess I'm opening it up for the board on thoughts and discussions, Scott. Um, we, we just wanted to make it sure we had an opportunity to talk about this, where we stand, continue to watch the numbers, and see if a, um, at some point, if there is a shutdown, when might that occur and where, when might that be needed? So. Okay, Mike, thanks, Mike. Um, so, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, thanks, Scott. Mike, uh, 
when you refer to our numbers are in the 90s, what numbers are you talking about? Yep. Are those kids in quarantine, staff? Are, what, what do the numbers refer to? Yeah, so our daily posting um, is now, it's, it's been defined for us a little bit, John. So in the beginning, we were just reporting total numbers, but now we break it out a little bit. If you go to our, our website and the link, it will be, so in the 90s would be all staff or students who are quarantined. Then we break it out by building, and you can see in there that we don't have any single building that's an outbreak either. That's the other one. It's kind of been spread across the district. Um, our number of current positive cases, Cindy may be able to make sure I'm right on this, three. Three, um, and we were able to move them out. And so, um, that's okay. Um, and is three, is three staff, students, or both? It, we use it as both. Um, and we're, we've been asked by the health department at this point not necessarily break that out. Um, it's pretty easy to determine probably when it's a staff member or, or a instructional staff member. It's very noticeable when they're out. So we did have to quarantine an entire classroom. So close contacts are, are certainly quarantined. But, but when we got down to three or four kids left in the classroom, it, we found it was easier to move full remote to that classroom. So the teacher similar to Pam right now, is not very symptomatic. And so she's going to be able to instruct the entire class in the remote mode. And so we, you will see us begin to do that because we also have concerns a little bit about um, just regular subbing. So our sub pool is down about half of what it would normally be in a year. And certainly as we enter into the winter season, um, we always struggle to cover all classrooms anyway. Um, this could play into the, to our decision making of quarantining a whole classroom and moving it to remote. Or if we did get spread in a building, maybe shutting a building down temporarily. And so those are strategies we, we, we could use versus closing the whole district as well. Did I answer One you? last question. Yeah. I, I, sorry, Mike, I've got one last question. I, I was trying to take notes. I heard you say someone believes kids are safer in school. Yeah. For, so Who Fred, said that? Fred Yanoski, our, okay. our county health director, kind of has, has constantly believed that with all our mitigation efforts, that kids tend to be safer in school. And they're not saying versus their home, but the problem is, as we know, uh, when quarantined at home, people are moving out and about and doing other items. Okay, thank you. Mike, I've got a question, and you may not be able to answer it, but at what point do we monitor the numbers and then reconvene to decide how education is gonna be delivered moving forward and or do we weigh the balance of winter sports versus face-to-face uh, -face education? Yeah, so we had a little discussion around that yesterday. Um, we're gonna have to have another spe special board meeting here probably in a week with the um, insurance bids being finalized on that. So we'll have one in early November. Then you are scheduled for your regular board meeting on November 16th. And then we have a little gap until December. And so I think over the next three meetings, um, we need to continue to bring the numbers to you, monitor the situation. And then, um, Scott, again, to talk about other techniques, maybe after, after our discussion with Fred yesterday, of quarantining classrooms and going remotely to, to mitigate the efforts or quarantining a partial part of a school or quarantining an entire school if we have an outbreak. Now, our outbreaks have not been by school yet. And so um, the closest we came was the situation in Jefferson where we were quarantined three classrooms just to make sure we had full control over that. And it did clean it out. In two weeks, we were done with it, and there was no further spread of that piece of it. So if we run into sub-shortage, quarantining classrooms where teachers can continue the instruction may be a, a, a very good strategy for us. Okay. Thank you. It, it does bring up a good point, though, Scott. I wonder if you know, how, how would we monitor so that it's transparent to the community what's going on? Would it, would it make sense to have kind of every other week check in through a special board meeting like this? Do we have a, a dashboard? Yeah, so have you guys gone to our website? If, yeah. you, if, you, if you haven't, go right now to go to our website and you'll see it there. And it is posted daily and broken out. And so that um, we know we have, um, citizens modern at each day making decisions for themselves if they want to send their students to school or not. And that breaks it out pretty good. I think we have um, on there close contact 
and we have probable, which is considered um, a positive, and so we have positive on there. So people can make the decision. When you go and you look at it, all but the th three presently are close contacts. Yeah, yeah, correct. And then we, we go a step further and we break it out. Those that were positive within the school district or outside the school district. And so, and then the spread of that. And so we try to uh, give all the data we can there. So there's quite a bit of data there. Um, and then again, your, Phil's comment about regular meeting, well, we're probably going to have to meet again next week. So we certainly can yeah. bring these numbers again. We can bring them on November 16th anyway um, as we go forward. Great. Mike, Mike is, it, is the data that we're talking about populated through the health department? Yeah, so every morning, and by probably while we're sitting here, it'll be coming any minute from the, from the health department. Now, we're in constant contact with them. When I say constant, give them a lot of credit. Um, they're, they're working um, at, you know, all the hours of the day, and our principals are as well. So we get a moment's notice, and our principals are doing contact tracing and sending it the data the best we can to the health department. We, we are able to assist them on who was close contacts by seating charts, um, viewing videos on buses, things like that. But they're the determining factor on um, the number of days quarantine, when did the quarantine start, when did they end, um, all those pieces of that. We get that daily back from them, from the health department. Awesome. Mike, I Maybe just a, a comment first and then a question. You know, overwhelmingly I've had positive feedback from community members on just how much work everybody's putting into this and they're extremely appreciative of all that the administration and staff and principals and teachers are, are doing to make sure that we are safe inside the building. So thank you for that. Um, on the order of contact tracing, do we, do we have enough resources and there's, is there anything extra that we can do as a school to assist Fred and his staff? So Fred was able to add a couple um, employees through some grant dollars to assist on the contact tracing for schools and they made us priority number one in the school district in that and so um, so far they've kept up with it. I actually asked a question yesterday. For example, I said, you know, I don't know how you guys are doing it and um, for example, on Sunday, between myself and a couple of principals in the health department, we were probably in constant contact on an hourly basis for eight to 10 hours. So Sunday was a busy day trying to figure all those out before Monday, making the phone calls home and telling them that, you know, keep your child home at this point in time. Um, and so, so far they've kept up, so far we have. Um, getting more help probably isn't gonna help. It probably takes a principal's um, skill level to make sure we communicate the message appropriately to make sure we truly can say we've done the full extent of determining anybody who was close contact. And then the other question I had, Mike, um, was it, if, if we do need to start closing, did were you able to talk to Fred at all and his staff about order in which we would prioritize buildings? I mean, obviously, if you have an outbreak in a school that has to close, but you know, we've seen other districts um, close high schools first because virtual is a little bit easier for that age level. You know, kindergarten being our, our number one priority to keep in person if we can, those kind of um, options. Yeah, we certainly know that the, the educational component of virtual at the sec secondary, the children are a little more independent and that works versus elementary. But in our case with the elementary, um, since we were able to sign all MPS staff members, that actually seems to be going a little smoother virtually than the secondary where we had to use a vendor on a lot of the courses. So keep that in mind. Um, but our, most of our cases have occurred at the secondary level. So very few have occurred at the elementary level, and the few that have have all been exposed in their homes by an adult. And so the, it appears that the elementaries are less at risk um, at this point. And we haven't had a single positive case in the elementary of a student we have had of, of staff.
the staff may become an issue. That seems like the ones we're seeing more and more adults test positive in our community. And, you know, as Pam earlier said, you know, then that alludes to other family members in the household often that turn positive. Mike, where do, we, where do we stand in our pool of substitute teachers? Yeah, numbers are, were low to start with, Brad, because uh, many of the substitute probably are in, fall into that risk age level or health level, and so our numbers were oh, maybe 60% of what our normal pool would be. And, and keep mindful that we supply, we're the conduit for supplying the subs to not only ourselves, but Meridian Bullet Creek as well. And so that number's down. Um, we um, asked and got from you guys an approval to up substitute rates. Last year we went up from 80 to $90 a day. Today it's, we're going to move, I think it's today, right? Yes. Yeah. November 1st, excuse me, we're going to go from 90 to $100. I don't know if that's enough to increase that pool. But um, so far, we've had, a as, as of yesterday, we had a 97% fill rate uh, when somebody's out. So that's pretty good. So the subs that we have are taking assignments. And to be truthful, I think our staff has been in attendance more than they have in the past. Um, and so they're being pretty good about that. But when we lose you know, a teacher for 14 days out, that could be an issue, and if we get short, I think it's going to be the quarantine in classroom and moving the whole classroom to remote. So your your child may not be a close contact, but we're going to keep you home so the whole class can learn remotely from that teacher versus not being able to fill it with a qualified person. That answer your question? Yeah. So should we take a different tact in advertising for our substitutes to say uh, parents and people of the community? We are low on st substitute teachers, but in order for us to stay face to face, that is the critical path that we have to have the substitutes to be able to stay face to face. Not just we need substitute teachers because of normal conditions. We need substitute teachers to keep kids in school. That's the message. Yeah, we could. I think you're right. We could probably add that to our. And you know, we do that every week in the community as we're short subs and bus drivers all the time so maybe it's time for a little different messaging on that and we could add that in there okay and then at the beginning of the meeting and we've kind of touched on this obviously um, moves that have been made to date of in our individual schools and or even if we have to Worst case scenario, we look at a, a hot spot of a school that may need to go virtual for a, a period of time. Um, per bylaws or per laws period, who has the power to close a school or a school district? Is that sitting with the superintendent and or with the board? Yeah, so everything I've looked at, Brad, um, it's not very clear. And so some... Um, there is some language out there in resolutions and your in policies where um, superintendents have taken to their board to grant them kind of emergency powers, and I have uh, chosen not to bring that to you right now. I don't know that I really want all that sitting with myself as well, and so I really think that's partly why I called this meeting today or asked you guys to call the meeting today was on the weekend I probably had a little bit of a panic mode and said, oh, oh boy, are we heading into this situation? And I really don't think that's just a me decision. So um, I think it's, it, is, it, it, it is the school board's um, authority probably that you, you could grant to me, but I don't think it's bad to have the decision in this case like we are where we're all sitting down to making this discussion. Now, if you want me to have that ability, I do it, but I, I just don't know that it should be in just one person's hand making that decision. So moving forward, our plan is that... In, at least I would recommend that we, we, we rec okay. reconvene at, before we make any drastic decision of closing um, more, than, more than a school building and closing the whole district for any kind of period of time. You, know, you, you obviously grant me the power to uh, call weather days, right? And if we had one day or something, I think that's still a prerogative that you'd leave me with. But if we're talking longer term, I'd much rather have the discussion with you guys. Okay. All right. Do we have any other uh, discussion? Any other questions for Mike? Okay. 
Mike, thank you so much for the update. Is there anything else you want to let us know before we part ways this morning? We'll just keep bringing you data, and we'll keep following us closely. I think uh, winter co-curricular, extracurricular activities are going to be a tough topic for us as we go forward. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we'll, we will keep our eyes on the numbers, and um, you'll schedule us a new meeting date at some point next week, um, yep. and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, at this point, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Motion by Phil. Uh, I think that was support by John? Yep. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. No opposed, I assume. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. Have a great Tuesday morning, and we will see you all in a week. Thanks. 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 Bye.